I mentioned in the previous video that in September of 2021, I had virtually like no experience with game development to now launching my first Steam page for my upcoming game, Castlemancer. And please wishlist Castlemancer over on Steam. It really helps me out. But here is how I learned game development. This video is sponsored by Brilliant, but more on that later. And thank you to these patrons over on Patreon. So I feel like anyone who has generally played video games throughout their life has at one point or another thought about developing their own. Or even just doing a bit of theoretical game design in their head like, oh, in World of Warcraft, this would be fun, or in League of Legends, this would be fun. There are four main pillars that I think go into learning game development. Programming, art, game design, and time, and I'll cover each of these topics. So first is programming. Now for me, I was fortunate in that I studied mathematics and computer science in college, and I actually used C Sharp a lot at my first job out of college at Microsoft, which is the primary language used in Unity. So I was generally familiar with programming paradigms. So if you already know how to code, then you're already kind of a step ahead, and it really just comes down to learning the game engine that you plan on using, which honestly just really comes with time. For me, I basically just looked up YouTube videos of the general structure of Unity, how game objects, mono behaviors, and scriptable objects worked, then really started implementing some basic features of a 2D game. Because in my head, I thought 2D game development was just a little bit easier than 3D rendering and modeling and, you know, the 3D side of things. So things like four directional movement, sprite animations, game object controllers, etc. And honestly, I think that is generally a pretty beginner friendly way of starting off. Given you already know how to code and you've built some previous projects before and you're pretty comfortable with which is learning new technologies, which is generally common in the computer science and programming sphere. Recently, I've also been using ChatGPT to help fill in some of the gaps when I'm looking to implement a certain feature. For example, with my game Castlemancer, wishlist on Steam again, I was writing a script such that enemies would attack the closest enemy to them. Now, there are obviously a couple different ways to do this, but I wanted to know the most optimal or efficient way because I know there would be a lot of computation if you scale up the number of AI agents. So I first asked this question to ChatGPT, which gave me the naive answer of just comparing the actual distances. But after asking it to optimize it, it actually gave me a pretty great response to use the squared distance, which is actually more efficient when you use it to compare distances because the square square root is actually a sort of computationally intensive mathematical problem, especially when you're doing it a bunch of times. So that's just kind of one example of how I'm continuing to learn and my strategies right now. Now, if you don't know how to code, things are going to be slightly more challenging, but there are a couple different options you can kind of go with. Trying to learn game development without learning how to code first is kind of like trying to bake a cake without knowing how to turn on the oven, and you're kind of just figuring out how to turn on the oven while also baking the cake. So you can definitely do that it just maybe might be slightly more confusing. So it really depends on what sort of goal that you have. You can opt for a less code intensive game engine or other no code solutions like GDevelop or GameMaker. Granted, I haven't used these specifically, but I think it does sort of limit the functionality you may be able to implement in those games. Generally, as you get more and more abstracted away from the code, it gets easier, but also more restrictive. But there's nothing wrong with that. It just depends on sort of what game you want to make. So you could just pop into GDevelop or GameMaker and see if it's really something that you want to get into. If you are dedicated to actually learning game programming or just programming in general, I would start with something like C Sharp so that you can hop into Unity or Godot. I would watch some general tutorial videos just on what programming is and kind of general common features like variables, if statements, loops, general class structure, as well as general problem solving as when you start coding, your brain, I feel like, also kind of switches to view problems from a more algorithmic perspective. So generally developing that sort of algorithmic perspective or kind of stepwise way of approaching a problem I think is generally helpful. Another great resource for helping develop that logical way of thinking is this video sponsor, Brilliant. But why is Brilliant helpful? Brilliant.org is the best way to learn math and computer science interactively. Brilliant has thousands of lessons from foundation and advanced math to AI, data science, neural networks, and more. And there are new lessons added monthly. Now I've actually started to realize that data science is actually a really important skill to develop for game development, which might not be super obvious. But for example, understanding the gaming market, game pricing models, growth in the user base of your genre, and others are all really important aspects when it comes to marketing and releasing an indie game. 
in which case Brilliant's data science courses could prove very helpful. If you're committed to continuously developing skills as a professional, Brilliant can be an essential tool. Plus, it has bite-sized courses that are designed for busy people, and Brilliant's interactive nature makes it more effective in learning and building analytical skills. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Marcella, or click on the link in the description below. The first 200 of you will also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thank you to Brilliant for supporting the channel. Then I would research about specific C-sharp syntax. If you're not familiar with the programming world, syntax just refers to the general style of a programming language, where a loop in Python looks slightly different than a loop in C-sharp. Now, you don't have to be a master at algorithms or data structures. I'm certainly not, but having a background will definitely help in certain instances of game programming at least from what I've noticed. Now, before you hop into making the next Stardew Valley, I would start with some simple C-sharp programs. You don't have to do any sort of front-end or UI work, but just write a program that will sort a list of strings based on length or alphabetically. There are a bunch of beginner programming projects, more on the back-end side in C-sharp or C or C++ or Java that you can just look up and kind of do any one of those in, you know, a few hours. Basically, the more experience that you have, the better. And once you feel more comfortable with C-sharp and programming in general, then start looking at some very simple games in Unity with tutorials, or even use ChatGPT or other large language models like I mentioned before. Now, ChatGPT doesn't get everything correct, but I've seen it do a pretty decent job. So that was the programming side, so now for the art side, including the music side and stuff like that. Personally, and I've mentioned this before, I'm really not artistically inclined pretty much in every aspect of art. Art, music, you know, uh, other things, writing maybe. It just doesn't come as naturally to me, but fortunately, the programming side does. So in my case, I've paid artists for many of the assets I used and then have altered some of them slightly here or there. I've tried looking up pixel art tutorials before, but I feel like I'm really out of the art world generally. I find it very difficult. Like, I don't really understand, like, proportions or shading or perspective, really. So for me, that was just the best and fastest option. And I think that generally aligns with my career goals. I'd much rather be a game programmer and designer and work with a game artist than being a game artist also. If that resonates with you, you can look at assets on the Unity Asset Store, places like Open Game Art or itch.io, or look for artists taking commissions on places like Fiverr, ArtStation, or even Twitter. But I know for many people, that's like the complete opposite. They really like the art side and hate the programming side. But if you are interested in creating your own own art, you have to first determine if you want to focus on a 2D or 3D style first. If you want to focus on 2D, then you have to choose a more niche style, like a cartoonish hand-drawn style or pixel art, for example. And again, there are some great tutorials on YouTube completely for free utilizing software like Aceprite. If you're leaning more towards 3D, I'd suggest checking out Blender and again looking into some tutorials either on YouTube or their website. You can also enroll and pay for like an actual class, but I always lean towards the free options until I'm positive this is something something I want to invest more time and money into. Now, I'm not super familiar with the music side, but I know you can look to compose in software like Ableton or FL Studio. But again, that's a whole other section of game development and media that people dedicate their entire lives to. And I can't even read sheet music. But in the end, there are tutorials for literally everything. So if you have enough dedication and time, I'm pretty confident you can learn pretty much anything up to, you know, a certain level, at least a level you need to develop a game, I think. Now that you've studied programming, you've either bought some art or created some assets yourself, there is the game design side, which I think is a little bit less tangible than something like programming or art. The best tip that has really helped me is to look at some of your favorite games and actually diagram out the core gameplay loop of that game. And this can be in your head, as I often do, or you can actually write it out. I've actually been thinking about doing this. I've mentioned a previous tool called Excaladraw that you can really make, you know, fast kind of gameplay loop diagrams that I think is really cool. So if you like Stardew Valley, for example, write out what you actually do in the game as a gameplay loop. So the day starts, you check your crops, you go into town, you talk to some townspeople, you go to the mines, and then you go to sleep, for example. Or a game like Terraria. You gather resources, you build houses, tools, and weapons, and you defeat bosses and survive. Now, you don't need to document all of the little nuances in each of these games, but you're really trying to hone in on identifying the core gameplay. In every game, there are little Easter eggs or little mini games and such things, but you need to identify and understand what is actually a core gameplay loop. And this exercise will really help get your mind into the place of splitting a game into its key components. Then for your first game, choose a generally simple genre like a platformer or maybe a narrative game 
or even in a cozy mobile game, before embarking on something really complex. Which I've heard from a lot of other game developer YouTubers, and one of those things that I actually really regret not doing. And the fun part about learning game design is that you can really get inspiration from anywhere, whether that's actually playing other games and really liking how they implemented a certain feature or mechanic, like a game like Peglin, or even just browsing Twitter. Literally the other day I was on Twitter and saw a tweet where someone did a mock-up of an app where if you're taking a flight, someone could challenge you to a duel for your seat. Now that was obviously a joke, but I thought that could be a really fun game. And I immediately thought of a low poly ragdoll type brawler game where you're trapped at an airport and in order to escape you have to like fight other players for their seat on the plane. And now you can use the excuse that you're doing intensive research when you're seven hours into Diablo 4. Now trust me, I am literally not a professional game designer, but these are the subtle things that I've done to slowly get better at recognizing gameplay loops and generally improving my game design sense. And now lastly is time. Time is the ultimate resource, and this will drastically depend on your personal situation. Do you have a full-time job? Did you just quit? Are you in college? Are you developing alone? Do you have a team? Do you have other hobbies? Are you in a relationship? How often do you go out? These are all questions you need to ask yourself when determining how much time you actually need to dedicate to your game development hobby. So on one side of the spectrum, you have a full-time job, you are developing alone, you are in a relationship and have other hobbies or time commitments, which is basically where I'm at. And that means that building and releasing a game will take much longer than the other side of the spectrum. Just mathematically, if you work eight hours, sleep eight hours, maybe you have two hours for cooking, eating, cleaning, maybe another two hours for other random time fails like going to the bathroom or commuting or other random stuff, that leaves like four hours. And that's if you don't do anything else. So I've noticed for myself that it definitely turns into a marathon and not a sprint. You basically just have to find time in between your other stuff until you get to the point where you can maybe take it more seriously, like if you got funding or started pulling in some serious money. On the other side of the spectrum, where maybe you don't work right now, or you're taking a break and you're working on the game with a few people and game development is your main hobby, you can probably pump out a game much faster. Again, it all just depends on your personal situation. And honestly, how much time you just want to commit to this with no guaranteed payoff. But I think the important takeaway is to try to not compare yourself to others. As they say, comparison is the thief of joy. Because it's easy to see on YouTube or Twitter or Reddit or Steam that someone created a really great game in six months, where you're one year into a project without a demo. But you don't know the other person's circumstances, so you just gotta focus on trying to complete your game and improving your game development skills. Now there are obviously many other skills to game development like marketing, testing, pivoting, things like that, but I think just for the initial learning game development, the four main pillars of programming, art and design, and time are foundational for starting. And if you're weak in one area, it's definitely great to ask for help. Not every game needs to be some masterpiece developed by a single person in their basement. And working with other people can even add different perspectives and angles that can prove really useful versus just working on it yourself. So that's really the whole process I took when it came to trying to learn game development and the various pillars that go into it. Wishlist my roguelike survival card game Castlemancer over on Steam again. You can also sign up for news and potentially play testing on castlemancer.com. Subscribe to the channel if you like tech, computer science, and game development. We do a bad British accent at the end of every video. That's all for me. Hopefully, I see you in another one. Bye bye.